In this lecture, I will mainly focus on protein stability, one of the applications of using different bioinformatics tools as well as the parameters to understand the structure of the protein as well as function of the protein in terms of protein stability. In the previous class, we discussed about predicting the 3D structure of a protein from its amino acid sequence because the amino acid sequence contains information regarding the 3D structure. So, we can utilize the information which you can obtain from the sequence to predict the 3D structures. So, we discussed about various methods to predict the 3D structures and the one of the major ones is the homology modeling. Homology modeling is based on Right, the assumption that if two sequences share high identity or homology, and then these sequences have similar 3D structures. Right. So, if the sequence identity is more than 80 percent or 90 percent, right, you can obtain a reliably good model, right, which can be similar to the structures which can be obtained by experiments. So, what are the various steps used in homology modeling? Starting from the template, template and do the alignment, alignment corrections backbone. and backbone generation, loop modeling, side chain orientations and the optimization. Right. Finally, we validate the structure right, using the energy or the stereochemical properties. So, if a sequence cannot have indetectable identity with any of the structures deposited in PDB, in this case the knowledge based approach will fail and homology modeling may not give you reliable results. So, you can use the fault recognition right based on the probability of the residues which can be in contact or the physical chemical properties or depending on the gaps you can be able to identify the faulting type. Even if it is not possible then you can try to use the initial methods you can start from scratch and this is based on the physical uh, energetic calculations. So, you can get the structures for any protein sequences. CASP is the competition for the structural uh, prediction algorithms right you can submit and then evaluate based on known 3D structures. When you go with the protein stability right what is the protein stability means right when the protein is synthesized in ribosomes and then go to the folded state it fold from the random coil conformation to the table steady structures. So, the steady structures are also important right to perform a function. For example, if you have a thread, if it is loosely a, a thread loose thread, then it is wobbling on the air. So, you can go anywhere right you can see the kite. So, it will go uh, wobbling anywhere. So, in this case it is difficult to perform a function. So, when if you have the like kind of thread then maybe it is stable right then gives some specific conformation. Likewise, we never day to day life right. If we are stable, we are healthy then we are able to perform the functions right. It is very important for the proteins to have any have the stable conformation. So, if you look into this unfolded state there is a kind of a wobbling conformation. So, the major factor which are influenced by this conformation it is entropy depends upon the how I mean degrees of freedom this uh, protein they have in the unfolded state. Then we go to the folded state right this 3D structure is maintained by different types of interactions. Specifically you can say that electrostatic interactions, Van der Waals interactions, hydrogen bonds, uh, hydrophobic interactions, disulfide bonds and so on. The, the electrostatic Van der Waals and these are non-covalent interactions and you can say disulfide bonds is this kind of the bond between the two sulfur atoms in system. So, we look into this contribution in the folded state and the unfolded state the contribution is very high in terms of all the types of interactions. And if you look into the difference between the folded and unfolded state it is very less right and the difference is about uh, 5 to 25 kilo kel per mole. So, why this marginal stability is important because in the living systems right certain proteins should be available in right in specific quantities. If you produce more and more proteins and if there is not able to degrade then the amount will be very high. So, it is easier to degrade any protein at any point of time. Second aspect is it is also important to change the conformation when a specific protein is interacting with any ligands or other, other uh, biological molecules. So, in this case they have to maintain a small difference in stability 
between unfolded state as well as in the folded state and the difference is normally in the range of 5 to 25 equal equal per mole. So, now here we discussed about different terms one we discussed about the enthalpy this is the total energy of the system determined by different types of interactions. On the other hand we discussed about the entropy this is mainly the uh, unfolded state of the system and these two terms can be related using free energy right that will give you the uh, uh, between the folded and folded state that is 5 to 20 kilo per mole. Then we discuss what is entropy or what is enthalpy or what is free energy. We talk about enthalpy right what is the definition of enthalpy? Right, you might have studied in your uh, school uh, classes, right? See, so, amount of heat used or released in a system at a constant pressure. So, if you see the enthalpy, it consists of two terms. One is the internal energy of the system plus the product of pressure and volume. That is a mechanical work. So, if you see the enthalpy, it can be obtained related with any reference point, right? Not for the any specific point, right? So, in this case, we can see the change in enthalpy, not the absolute enthalpy. You can change the enthalpy. There is delta H. This can see with respect to any reference point. This can be related as delta E plus P into delta V, right? Because the change in volume and change in internal energy of the system. If delta H is positive, then what does it mean? It is endothermic reactions. It absorbs heat because of this absorbance of heat, it gets cold, right? The, this environment gets cold. So now it is negative. There is a heat re releasing process. This you can see exothermic process. In this case, the environment gets hot. So, I have a question. So, what is the change in enthalpy in any reaction? If it releases 100 kilojoule of energy and the P delta V work is 10 kilojoule. Here, what is the solution? We can see delta H, this is equal to delta E plus P in delta V. Delta E, which is what is the sign for delta E? Because it is releases. So, this is minus 100 plus 10 kilojoule, that is equal to minus 90 kilojoule. Right, this is we can get the uh, enthalpy for any, any system. Now, if you take a internal energy, so internal energy represents all the energy contained in the material. For example, it is kinetic energy, or you can see inter intermolecular interactions like bond energy, electrostatic energies, Van der Waals force, and so on. So, at constant pressure and volume, so delta V equal to 0. In this case, you can see delta H equal to delta E. Right, this is the internal energy of the system. Right, you can represent delta H as the internal energy of the system that means different types of interactions. When you go to entropy, simply entropy means the disorderness or the randomness in the system. So, if you comparing the ordered system and the disordered system, which one will have high entropy? Disordered system, right. The ordered system has low entropy and the disordered system has less entropy. For example, if you have solid state, this is ice, right, you can see then go into water and then into vapor. So, the case of ice, what is the, what is the, it is uh, more random or less disorder? It is less it is disorder, it is more ordered. So, in this case, the entropy is less. less, right, and compared to the water. Then it increases in water, and you can see water vapor, you can see it is mostly disordered. And also, you can see the difference from the solid to uh, liquid and liquid to gas state. It is very highly disordered from the liquid to gas state. So, now if we have the enthalpy and the entropy right and also along with this temperature that we can explain the free energy that is called Gibbs free energy. So, this free energy is spontaneous if there is a net input of energy. So, in this case right this it is a, a spontaneous one. So, you have Gibbs free energy we can use a simple delta G to different Gibbs free energy because we use the word Gibbs because firstly discovered by the uh, J W Gibbs this is the reason why we call this as Gibbs free energy. So, we can combine the enthalpy, entropy right and temperature right using the equation delta G equal to delta H minus T in delta S. Why we call this free energy? Because it is the energy available to work with the expense of the entropy. So, this is why I call this is the uh, entropy of the system, okay, this is the enthalpy of the system. So, we can see delta G is given as delta H minus T in delta S. If delta H is negative, in this case, the process is spontaneous, which can do work. Right? We do not need any extra energy required to carry out the work. If it is positive, then we need it is not spontaneous, we need to give energy to do the work. This is the reason if you use this delta G, usually this is negative. Right? In this case, it can do the work spontaneously. So, how to interpret this delta H and T delta S? 
to get the value of delta g. So, if you see the different types of interactions, you can see delta h this enthalpy. So, mainly the changes in bonding energy and you can see different types of non coal interactions like van der Waals energy, hydrophobic energy, hydrogen bonds and other charge interactions. If you look at the entropic term, you can see this is the arrangement of the, the solvents in counter ions, how they changes. For example, the rotational degrees of freedom, transmission changes and so on. This will uh, account for the entropy of the system. So, we have the enthalpy and we have the entropy, you can calculate free energy, right. That is the uh, general definition for the free energy. If you talk about the proteins, when you discuss in terms of the stability in proteins, how we obtain this free energy, how to obtain this uh, delta G and how this delta G is related with contributions of different interactions. We can get the experimental data using different experiments on one hand. On the second hand, you can see this experimental delta G can be related with the other interactions like electrostatic, van der Waals and hydrogen bonding interactions. We will see how we obtain this information. On one hand, delta G you can obtain from the experiments, right. For example, circular dichroism or differential scanning calorimetry or fluorescent spectroscopy and so on, right. There are two different ways, either we denature with thermal by giving heat or you can uh, denature using the denaturant like the urea or guanine hydrogen chloride and so on. So, actually you can get, this is one side. So, on the other hand, you can see get the delta G, you can calculate delta G from protein 3D structures, various interactions and you can relate how far this can be related with each other. So, let us see first how we get the experimental free energy using any of these techniques. Right. Here you can see the data for the fluorescence spectroscopy so and urea denaturation. So, we add urea, right, you can see the different concentrations of urea, so here 1 to 9 and you can see how we get the fluorescent density. In this part, right, in the left hand, left mode side, so here and see, so here this is the folded state, right, and slowly if you add the denaturant, it comes to slowly denature and if you can see the denaturation, this side and finally, this stage you can see is completely unfolded. So, in the folded state, if you see the intensity is 366, right, this is the called Y f this is equal to 366 and unfolded state you can see this is y, y u equal to 51. Then using this graph for different concentration and the fluorescent intensity values, this is possible to derive the value for delta g at any point. So, for example, if you take this point, in this case y equal to 256, right, 256. Then what is the contribution? for the folded state and the what is the contribution from the unfolded state. If you take any point, if you add up the contribution for a folded y a folded folded plus the contribution from unfolded this equal to 1, right. Here in this case a fully un, uh, folded here unfolded and if you take any point that is a fraction. In this case you can give the value as any point y, the fraction y you can give as this is the fraction for the folded state and here is a fraction for the unfolded state. O e equal to y f into f f plus y u into f u. Now, you compare this equation, equation number 1 and equation number 2, you can derive the values that for f u and uh, uh, f f. For example, here f f plus f u equal to 1. So, f f equal to from this equation, right, f f equal to 1 minus f u. Now, you substitute this value right in this equation, you can calculate the value of f u right y f minus y divided by y f minus y u. Likewise, you can get the f f as y minus y u divided by y f minus y u right for if you take this number right f f equal to 1 minus f u. So, here this will become y equal to y f into 1 minus f u plus y u into f u, right. Then you combine together, right, the f u and f f and you solve this equation, you will get f u as this equation. Now, you can have the values y f equal to 366, right, here you can see the 366 and here y unfolded equal to 51 and you take any point, for example, we take this point, right, this, this point. So, in this case y equal to 56. So, substitute these values in this equation, then f u equal to 0 
because this is equal to y of is 366 unfolding is 51 and the midpoint you take 256. Then the f f this is given as y minus y u divided by y f minus y u right you will get the values of y u y f right and will get that value this 0 0.65. So, we have the unfolded state and the folded state fractions we can convert this information in the equilibrium constant that is the k, k is given as f u minus f f. So, f u we calculate 0 0.35, f f we calculate as 0 0.65 right we take the ratio then it is 0 0.54. Then we take the logarithmic of this one, right? This is equal to minus 0 0.61. From that, we can calculate delta G. So, this is minus R T logarithmic of this equilibrium constant. So, R T equal to 0 0.596 kilo per mole at 300 degree Kelvin. Ln K is minus 0 0.61. So, substitute this value here and delta G you can get 367 kilo kel per mole. So, if you do the experiments at different concentration of urea, you get the fluorescent density values. This will give you the internal density at the folded state and the unfolded state and at the different states from the folded to unfolded state. From the intensity values of the folded state, unfolded state and at any point you can derive the equilibrium constant and from the equilibrium constant you can calculate the free energy right. Experimentally you can get right for any protein right using the uh, fluorescence spectroscopy. Likewise you can do it with the circular dichroism as well as differential scanning colorimetry. So, this is based on denatural denaturation. Likewise, you can use thermal denaturation. So, what is thermal denaturation? We get heat. heat, right. So, here you can see uh, with respect to temperature versus heat capacity. So, in this case you can directly measure this uh, transient temperature because amount of heat required to raise the temperature by 1 degree Celsius with respect to the 1 gram of substance without any change in the state, right. With no change in the phase you can calculate. So, we see the increase in temperature and finally, you get the transient temperature right where the protein started to melt and you get let us Cp because you have the Cp as unfolded state and Cp as the native state and get the difference right you can get the difference this will give you the delta Cp. Using the delta Cp and the transient temperature you can calculate the unfolded uh, delta G at any temperature T is at any temperature and you can get the other information from this graph and you can cal get the uh, delta G using thermal denaturation. So, we get the data for delta G with the denatured denaturation and thermal denaturation right these are the experiment data. Now, the question is how we interpret this data using the contribution from different interaction energies. So, how to do this? So, as we discussed earlier what is delta G? It is a free energy difference between folded state and folded state. So, you can see the folded state and you can see the unfolded state. So, what are the contributions of the folded state? This is merely enthalpy of the system. So, different interactions. What are the interactions? Hydrophobic. GHY, hydrophobic free energy, EL electrostatic free energy, and HB is hydrogen bonding free energy, diesel bonding free energy, and you can see Van der Waals free energy. These are all due to this folded state. When we take the unfolded state, what is the major contribution? Entropy, right? You can see the entropy contribution. And if you compare the folded and unfolded state, Unfolded state is not completely random. There may be some interactions are present which are available in the folded state. This is what we call as non entropic term. For example, if you have some sort of hydrogen bonds which are present in the unfolded state, this is for this we use non entropic term. Now, we see how we estimate all the interactions from protein 3D structures, right. We already we explained various parameters. What are the various parameters we discussed uh, using 3D structures? surrounding heterophobicity, different types of interactions and the surrounding accessibility and the contacts that we discussed all these aspects. So, we use some of this information to estimate different uh, interactions which contribute to the folded state of the protein. So, let us discuss about heterophobic free energy. Can we directly measure the heterophobic free energy? We cannot measure right this kind of imaginary force right. So, we can get the partition coefficient right say so relative solubility of either the water plus organic solvents. You can use the octanol, you can use ethanol right, you can use the concentration to get the partition right. So, you can see this uh, non polar to aqueous and the different concentration and you can see the free energy. Positive gives for the uh, hydrophobic and the negative gives this uh, non polar uh, amino acids.
So, if you say the positive free energy, so transfer is unfavorable. In, the, in this case, the solubility of non-polar is more. So, this gives the hydrophobic residues and negative free energy in this case it is less for the non-polar and gives the hydrophilic uh, residues. So, now if we have this amino acid residues we have the values, but for the proteins we cannot directly measure the hydrophobic free energy, but if you look into these parameters that we discussed in the previous classes about solvent accessibility and hydrophobicity, what is the correlation? Negative correlation, it is inversely related right, if it is highly accessible the less hydrophobic and if it is uh, less accessible this is buried they are highly hydrophobic right. You can use this information right, hydrophobicity we cannot measure directly, but accessibility can we calculate? Yes, if you have the structures then we have different methods, what are the methods to compute solvent accessibility? Access in excess right, you have the get area right, there are several methods you can calculate. So, then we convert this solvent accessibility to calculate the hydrophobic free energy right, I will show you how to do that. So, you can we know that accessibility is inversely proportional to hydrophobicity. So, we can write G H Y hydrophobic free energy which is proportional to delta A C F I. So, this proportionality we put this sigma i this atomic solvation parameters how different amino groups of atoms like carbon or hydrogen or nitrogen or the oxygen behaves in the environment of this protein environment. So, you can see different uh, chemical groups and we see this is positive for the hydrophobic atoms and negative for the charge and polar atoms right because of the inverse proportional between the hydrophobicity as well as the accessible surface area. So, now how to get these numbers right if you have this uh, accessible atomic solvation parameters and then we can calculate free energy right. For example, if you have atomic solvation parameters for the different types of atoms here I use 5 different types of atoms right what are the different atoms in protein structures? C nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, sulfur and the nitrogen we have two different types one is neutral and then is positive charge, oxygen we have two types neutral and negative charge. So, here the, the neutral and nitrogen oxygen we combine together right n and o and n plus o minus and s, but we can use different classifications right you can use nitrogen oxygen separately and the carbon main chain carbon and the side chain carbon separately right depending upon the connectivities depending on the amino acids we can use several classifications. Right. For simplicity here we use 5 different classes ok. If this is known and then we can calculate the hydrophobic free energy this is the method initially proposed by Eisenberg in 1984 right the published paper in nature. So, here A folded is the folded state accessibility uh, A unfolded is the unfolded state accessibility. So, can we have the unfolded state accessibility? Yes, because we if you have the Gly x Gly conformation and they calculate different systems and say the average or say the maximum values we can get unfolded state. Can we get the high high folded state accessibility? We can get if it is each atom. So, which algorithm can we use? DSSP? No, we cannot use DSSP because it gives you residue wise. N axis we can use right or get area you can use for each atoms. So, we have the value the folded state and we get the value of all unfolded state and if this is known delta sigma i you can calculate the hydrophobic free energy this is very simple. Now, the question is how to get this delta sigma i right I show you the accessibility. So, accessibility criteria we know we go rolling water molecule you can see how far this accessible to the solvent each atom accessible to solvent right here this is a figure you are familiar with this figure now right you can see this residues are in the interior and this residues are at the surface. And if you run the program you can get the values right either the either the residue is accessibility or the atomized accessibility. For calculating this hydrophobic free energy which data is required uh, atom wise or residue wise? Atom wise. Atom wise. So, you can see different atoms you can use these values to calculate the hydrophobic free energy. So, here this is the atom level accessibility. So, we can calculate for each residues and all atoms. So, this for the glycine alanine for all the 20 residues we can have the extended state accessibility right you can have the values. Right, these are the 20 different amino acids we have the data for all the atoms this is fine this is for the extended state right. Now, we have the folded state then you can calculate, but the problem is how we get the delta sigma i we need to calculate then how to get this delta sigma i. So, we relate delta sigma i with respect to accessibility and the hydrophobicity. So, here delta g r represents the hydrophobicity scale for example, you can take any hydrophobicity indices. Right, we discussed various categories indices 
either you obtain from experiments thermodynamic transfer experiments or you can get from the computational methods for example, surrounding, surrounding hydro obesity right you can use any value for delta G r. So, how many different amino acid residues 20, 20 residues. So, for each amino acid residue for example, alanine you can derive equation delta sigma i and a i also we know for each the atoms we know. If you take alanine you can use this hydro obesity value what is the value for alanine? 13.85. This 13.85, okay, this is the left hand side. We relate with this atomic solution parameters. How many atoms in alanine? Right, 5, five, five, five atoms, right? 4 main chain atom plus one, 1 side chain atom. So, if you make it a different groups, right? For example, if you see this alanine, right, alanine. So, we can, we can see that this is the data for alanine, right? y axis that is equal to 13.85, x axis this side right left hand side you can see that is a combination of different sigma i. So, different atoms in relation alanine this is n c alpha c o and c beta, but here this come to c right here and you can see n and o together. So, in this case you can see this n is 1.3 right this 1.3 delta sigma n and here is o here that is 0 0.9 plus 0 0.9 delta sigma o plus for the c, l, c right. So, what is the c totally this is 2.9 and 2.9 oh sorry this is not 0 0.9 this is O is 4.8, right? O is here, this is 4.8. C is here, you can this is 2.9 plus 0 0.9 plus 17.8. This is a delta sigma C, right? You can write this equation. You can use this equation, right? O equal to A plus B1 x1 plus B2 x2 plus up to B n x n. Here this is y is the height of obesity, right? Here this is y to height of obesity, and delta sigma i is the surround. This is the the parameters where we need to identify this one, right? This is the b1, b2, all these things, right? And i is the surround accessibility. So you need to calculate the coefficients b. So for the alanine, we get this one, right? For the glycine, this is a glycine. So if we see this is the c. This is 14 by 9, 14 by 9 in delta sigma c and 2.6 this also c right 2.6 into c and o is 7.3 right 7.3 is here. So, 7.3 o and n is 2.6 2.6 sigma n what is the value for the glycine. So, we get the values here glycine equal to 13.34. So, in this case it is equated to 13.34 likewise you can do for all the 20 different amino acid residues. Here we take the glycine for you have the data only for the delta sigma c and delta sigma n or o, it is only two variables, right? You get the equation. Likewise, alanine you get the two variables. If you go with the aspartic acid, then how many groups you have? Right, you can see the c and n and o we can combine together, and there is o minus. What is o minus? Negative charge. The negative charge, you can see the aspartic acid with aspartic acid, right? So, here if you see. You can see this OD1 and the OD2. This is 12.2, right, and 16.9, right. You can add the, the add of these two, so you get 29.1. So you get 20 different equations. So 20 equations, how many variables? Five. Five variables, right. So now we can this y-axis. So you can see the this is the head of these values. So what is the dimension of this matrix? 20. 20 into right 20 into 1. So, you have the 20 different values for example, alanine 13.35 aspartic acid we have 20 different amounts, right. So, this you can write in terms of these are the this what is this dimension 20 into 5 20 into 5 right because this is 20 amino acids and 5, five. atomic solution parameters right this is 20 amino acids and this 5 for the 
delta sigma i atomic salvation parameters. Okay, what is this the dimension of this matrix? 5, five into 1, right? Because this is for the 5 delta sigma i plus 1. So, in this case, right, if you have 5 equations and 5 variables, then easily you can solve it using principal least squares, right? This is the equation, this is the erroboricity, and here these are 5 different types of time solving parameters. This is the matrix which have these values. But here, our case, we have 20 equations and we have only 5 variables. In this case, we use the principle of least squares to see that identify the numbers, write the coefficients, so that the deviation is the minimum. So, you can see the deviation is the minimum of this y minus y bar the whole square. If you do like this, you can calculate the atomic solution parameters using this equation x transpose into x, write this inverse, and x transpose into y. If you do, do like this, finally, you end up with the matrix 5 star 5, 5 into 1. So, because it is 5 into 20, this matrix and inverse this 20 into 5 and you can see the transpose that is again 5 into 20 right and this transpose uh, 20 into 1. When you get solve this uh, matrices finally, you get the matrix 5 into 1. So, the here you can get the delta sigma i parameters. So, if you do this we can get the values for all these 5 parameters and I show the number this is the numbers we obtain for the 5 groups. For example, carbon 12.02 and nitrogen oxygen minus 5.86, N plus minus 9.46, O minus 34.98 and sulfur 13.51. It makes sense because if you see the hydrophobic groups, mainly carbon and sulfur, you can see the positive values right for the transfer into the protein environment and for the polar residues and charge residues that is minus. And if you compare the polar and the charge one, charge one have more negative right than the polar ones that means, these numbers are uh, meaningful and they are reliable, right? you can calculate the energy. So, when you get the delta sigma i, right? now we can easily calculate GHY because we know this, we know the A folded, right? we know the A unfolded. So, now I give a data, right? for example, this for a particular protein, you run an excess and then you can get the folded set ASA. So, for example, if you take the glutamic acid, right? that is the number 1. So, here you have the values of ASA for different atoms. For the same glutamic acid, you can get unfolded set accessibility, right? I show it here, right? So, glutamic acid you can write here. So, you can see the glutamic acid, we have the unfolded set ASA. So, the unfolded set ASA we have, folded set ASA we have, delta sigma I we have. So, you can calculate the hydrophobic free energy. So, how to calculate the hydrophobic free energy? Right, delta H for example, if you take this one. So, for example, if we take the N and O, we can join together. So, in this case, 41 minus 6, 41 minus unfolded set we will get from this a figure, and then again for the O 25 minus you can see the value from this one multiplied by what is the value for uh, N and O? Minus five points. Let's see eight eight six. Then plus go with all the carbons. So okay, one, two, three, four, five. Five carbons. You get the difference in accessible surface area, and multiplied by delta sigma of what is sigma of C. What is the value of sigma of C? This is equal to 12.02, right? This is 12.02. Plus, we can go for this y1, y2. So, in this case, the value is minus 34.98, right? Minus 34.98, and you can see the delta ASA of C of O minus. So, we need the data from the folded states and for all the 20 residues, you have the data in the unfolded states and for each atom type, you get the difference and multiply it with the atomic solution parameters. So, this is a folded state, unfolded state, multiply then you will get the values. So, do it for all the residues 
and add up everything together then you will get the value for the g h y right for all the all the atoms in a particular protein. So, easily you can calculate. So, if you have the 3 d structures you can calculate the fat of free energy even you can use the PDB param that is the server which calculates more than 50 structure based parameters you can get a fat of free energy right for any protein of known structure right it is easy now you can calculate the fat of free energy.